So thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you for taking time out of um, your schedule to come and listen to some amazing talks around Prometheus, TSDB, monitoring observability. Um, I'm Dom, one of the organizers, along with Bartek, Abida, Chris, wherever he's gone, Tom, who's not here today. Yeah, there's a couple of us, come and grab us. We always want new speakers. Um, oh, we've got an upbeat. Obviously means we're on. Uh, so tonight, we've got Adrian talking about observability, Toby about how we can use observability to look at your bank account, um, a quick break, then Lucas talking about karma and unseen. Um, but this meetup, like most other meetups, wouldn't have been possible without um, our hosts and our sponsors. So um, I'd like to thank Grafana for giving us um, some pizza, and obviously Cloudflare for letting us use their amazing office. Um, and Andrew from Cloudflare is going to get, say a couple of words. Um, so yeah, I'm going to pass it over to Andrew um, as the host for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dom. Hi, welcome everybody. So I'm Andrew Fitch. I work here at Cloudflare in developer relations. As you may have guessed, I'm an American, but uh, London is my preferred Cloudflare location actually. And we've reached about 210, 220 people here now in London. And I was just told recently when we did our kickoff uh, office opening party about a month ago that we have just as many engineers here as we do in San Francisco, our headquarters, which is pretty significant because we have way more people in San Francisco than London. So um, this sort of leads me into my first message here, work at Cloudflare. We're hiring engineers. Um, we would love lovely people like you to be applying to jobs here. And we don't have over 200 open roles here in London specifically. That would be absolutely absurd, though one day maybe we will. But I think we at least have, you know, in the couple dozen range or maybe even more. So please do check out our website. A lot of the roles are technical. Some of them are also not. Um, we're open to people of all types. But yeah, cloudflare.com forward slash careers. I produce a developer newsletter. Um, part of my responsibility is as a developer relations person is sort of creating content and churning out content. So if you're interested, please do um, check out our blog. You can click on developers there and scroll down and subscribe to the developer newsletter that we produce every month. The next one is going out, I think, June 15th, by the way. And this is kind of what's new in the serverless space specifically. Um, Cloudflare Workers is uh, uh, a new, new-ish product that we have. Um, where you can write JavaScript on our edge network and add functionality to your site or do whatever you want to do with it. We have a bunch of, we call them recipes, which are basically use cases of how you can use workers, code snippets that you can copy and test. Go check those out, play around in sandbox there. Um, and then another thing too, tomorrow evening, we're hosting a serverless meetup here in the space. We've actually rented a space downstairs because we have a network automation meetup in this space, but um, same space, same, uh, same check-in area and everything. So come and check that out if you can as well. And then I'll say another thing too before I go on to another event that we have. Um, if you're interested in hosting your meetup or another meetup that you attend here in the space, please do let me know or also check our blog because I published a post something along the lines of we want to host your technical meetup at Cloudflare London. If you just search for that on our blog, you'll see a submission form and everything. We'd love for people to be able to come here and do this because again, like not just for hiring messaging, but we want to bring the community in here to Cloudflare London and we want to be a part of the community as well. So it's a good match for that. And so if you enjoy this space, please do also consider that. Um, and now the event that I was going to tell you about is we call it Connect. This used to be called Customer Day, um, which was really like a sales event essentially for Cloudflare customers. We've created a developer track for it this year. So the speakers include our C-suite, you know, our CEO, our COO, our CTO, our Chief product officer as well are all speaking, but we've invited a lot of heavy hitter um, external developer speakers as well. So we have a separate sort of serverless development track. Uh, we'd love to invite you to this. I should tell you, however, the call, the call that I just got off a second ago in the lobby told me that um, we're now waitlisted. But if you're interested in joining, um, please do scan that code. And if you are interested in coming, you can either ask me at the end or something like that, because I can like put you on a special list. But you might be released off the wait list anyway. So if you're interested, please just open up your camera and take a take a shot of that, and it'll take you to the link. And um, I guess that's all I have to say for now. The restrooms, if you haven't already noticed, are all the way down there. We don't have adequate signage, in my opinion, but we will someday. Oh, yeah, and in case of fire, um, I, I don't quite remember what I'm supposed to say, but I think it's that we just we head out this way. And there are two people who are wearing vests in our lobby right now. Basically, the messaging is follow them and everything will be okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. And thanks, Tom. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, so we're going to kick off this evening with 
um, a talk about not everyone wants observability. Um, so Adrian, let's give a round of applause to Adrian. Hi everyone, I'm Adrian, nice to meet you. Um, I'm going to talk about a subject that really interests me, is humans and their relationship with tech. Um, in my short experience and the way, uh, uh, the discussions I have with friends, coworkers, and other people, not everyone is ready for observability, um, and we're going to try to see how we can navigate this. I'm Adrian, I live in Bordeaux, France, city of wine. Um, as Farmer became uh, a sorry, uh, in e-commerce uh, companies, and uh, I have my bunnies, love the wine, French food, stuff like that. Thanks to Mano Mano, my current company, uh, we are re re redoing the DIY and gardening experience online. So if you're interested, check it out Pela. So it's a story of tech people. Um, when you create um, and try to make people use new tools in your company, you think a bit often about yourself. Um, but what I think is works better is when you try to adopt a product approach, when you are trying to figure out who's the real people that's going to use what I'm building for the company, what are they going to do, uh, who's paying also for this, it's also important, and why we do this. So basically we need to find the value stream, we need to find the people interested in what we're doing, and we need to provide them with the tools and options to realize their dreams and objectives. So first, before we can start explaining people what observability is and why they need it, we need to first be sure that we need it and explain it, be able to explain it to the managers, to the business, to the engineers, why we're doing this. That's really important. Why do we want to change? Because usually when in your already established company, you already have some measures, stuff like that, not a lot of logs and you say that's enough, we want to do something. So first you have to start finding your users. Um, what again, it depends on your companies. Maybe uh, there's not a lot of engineers, not a lot of operations people, or you're already in a perfect world with product teams um, that all communicating perfectly together, aligned on the company's goal. So we're going to start with operations people. So operations people, usually they care about the infrastructure, the hardware, the operating systems, a bit of network, and the services like databases, queue uh, messaging, stuff like that. The network and the hardware are getting a bit abstracted nowadays because you have the cloud options and the serverless, but it's still something that's really important to watch for. I think I find often that network operation center effect, we call this, that huge wall of screens of Grafana dashboards um, that uh, need to be green, always green, um, especially when you get uh, the TV in there, or you get interviews, you have all the management, the CTO coming to that network center, and it needs to be green. So is that really observability, what's, the, what's going on in this center? Um, can't we do better? Can those friends, co-workers do, do better? Are they just waiting for the log partitions to fill up? Or are they proactive? Are they just react to, uh, to alerts? Or doing something to fix them, actually? So. I think sit down with them, see um, what their work is about, what their, is their daily routine, because introducing new tooling in observability will change the way they work, uh, where they have to start learning from QL, for example, or handling Grafana's, or doing log or tracing. It's part um, of a new change, and they need to be ready for that. Engineering people. Mostly it's the applications that they develop, that they rely on, so the other team's applications, and the services like the database mostly, or the queue messaging. I like to find um, usually the Rockstar team um, opportunity. It's like you have this new project, people, uh, important people find out, oh, React is the next new thing. We should we do a website in React, or maybe microservices in Golang, stuff like that. So um, usually, have free for all, unlimited business, unlimited money. Uh, the business is behind them. So that's where I think uh, if you start doing observability in your company, you should try to see uh, what they need because they will need tools to guarantee the success of that project 
then the, the business will be able to see that what they ship will increase um, the retention rate, the um, buying rate, order rate, stuff like that. So sit down and see what you can do in an afternoon. Maybe it's a Java application, microservice. Install the Prometheus um, integration. See, look, that's a metric. You get a dashboard in half a day. Do you want more? Are you interested in this? Or logs and tracing, of course. Um, what's also important is that when this project ends, they will usually go back to their original team. As well, the developers, as well as the business, uh, the product owners, stuff, uh, people in this world. And they will talk. They will talk about how that SRE team helped us achieve our business goal. The developers, when they go back to their old teams, maybe they will find, I miss that dashboard, uh, that Grafana dashboard. I miss being able to see what's really going on in production. And that will create maybe a snowball effect. To encourage uh, the usage of observability tooling, I think uh, the libraries is not something to be uh, neglected. Uh, really from the start, uh, because what you're going to do um, is to improve their life, you need to get into their code and you need to expose metrics or logs again. Um, so API, tooling, et cetera, et cetera. And you need to do them, uh, to develop them with them, sorry. Um, again, it's really important to show off what you do, uh, demo days, pair programming with them, um, and that will create evangelist people that will speak for you. They're not part of the SRO team or the observability team, but um, because they're really impressed in this, they will talk and share, spread the word. That's also really important. For uh, release engineering and QA, um, we are the next step here. We are really interested in the users, how the user experience when I deliver in production. Is the website working, the business running? What about the applications and the services around them? Um, I don't have a lot to say because um, about this because it's uh, still new, but uh, I like talking about the, the um, relationship with testing and observability. If you need alpha day to run your full end-to-end -end test suite uh, with hundreds of devices, you have all the iPads on the wall, on your desk and everything, but you, how long do you take to deploy to production? If you get in production in 10 minutes to 1% of your customers, of your users, how's that feedback going? All right, um, there's something to do more in this space, I think. Uh, testing is, Often a black box is going on, we wait for it to end, and then you say, yeah, we did that, or it fails. Um, this also encourages that cycle to go faster, to ship often, and roll back even more. And then finally, um, the business people, what I call like product owners, um, people that are owning the business units, um, they usually care, and they are also usually incentivized uh, with the bonuses and things like that about how the users uh, perform on their website. If no one's buying or using the business unit, uh, something's wrong with the applications. So they need to be aware of the application. Is it slow? Uh, are there a lot of bugs? And they also care about real user monitoring. That's also something that we don't talk a lot, I feel, in the um, observability space, uh, especially in metrics, because can, can't you have all your users and metrics when they browse the website? That's uh, a challenge. Uh, I think Grafana tried something, uh, but it's also a really interesting space because um, those people, those users, at the end, eat your infrastructure, eat the applications, eat the databases, and it's important to know where they come from and what they're doing on your website. And like a product, like you have a startup, you have an ID, uh, let's make cars, um, automatic cars. It's also about the execution. Um, it's not always about the tech. We can install Prometheus. A few exporters, uh, we can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on SaaS options, and that's great, but that's still not it. It's also about changing your company. Uh, that's one of the, my favorite slides. For the first time, depends on your company, of course, you will see what's really wrong with it, what's wrong with the IT system. And that's something not everyone is ready for it. You have egos in an organization that's human, that's normal. It's always easy to blame the networking, the database that is slow, but when someone else outside of your team points out, no, you are the one wrong here, it's what you developed, it's what you deployed, um, people can react badly. So 
that's why you need to really get interesting in this. Um, people could get hostile, and then there's wars and political stuff, and so not always great. And you will put a shining light on people that are, were not really responsible, depends on the companies, of what they ship, but they will become soon the center of attention. And not everybody is ready to get slacked. Uh, hey, uh, you just deployed that commit in production, it breaks stuff, what are you going to do about this? Uh, people are not ready, maybe the tooling is not ready uh, about that. Maybe that engineer cannot roll back what they shipped. There's um, all this to figure out because it's also uh, it's a culture to have. It's not just new people. They need to be able to react, to know how to react, and the company needs to be able to, um, to revolve around this. They need to be able to uh, know, okay, uh, everybody now is responsible. I won't trash talk uh, that developer. I will help him. I will say, look, that dashboard, that database is running slow. We can see, we can talk about that. You need to think about the inter integrations. Uh, depends on the tooling of your company. Maybe you have Jira. Uh, you use something other than Slack. Um, what can you do to bring the information where it matters the most? Um, maybe. Um, uh, I skip to the next one. Um, people need to trust your product. That's also an important one. If you have like two competing products in your company, maybe there's this old uh, monitoring system, Nijo, Sabix, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but you get a new one, but people don't trust that new one, they won't use it. And once the damage is done, it's really hard to go back because uh, they don't trust it. It's always down or it appears to be down. Um, my coworker told me that that sucks. Uh, the, Libraries uh, are slow, they're introducing overhead. Um, so you need to be really, really transparent about what you're doing. So again, it's a product, you're selling it to the whole company. So maybe a status page, maybe SLOs, SLAs. And you need to facilitate um, the onboarding. So you need to train um, your coworkers to use that platform. Uh, maybe do a lunch and you teach them some PromQL uh, syntaxes so they can start getting deeper and deeper and more interested in their ongoing work. Um, yeah, that's lot where Prometheus uh, rules, for example, auto-generation, auto-deploying uh, of those rules. Uh, you just deploy a new microservice, then automatically you get the dashboard going. That's really helpful uh, to go along the way. And it's hard to I find for um, non-really operational people to what's a great metric. Uh, what's the um, best metric and the cardinality is also an issue. Uh, we often see, let's just put a metric with um, the email address of my client in this, and this can, of course, cause issues. So you need to protect that, and you can protect that with rules, but also with training and um, getting people interesting in what you're building. I like those posters from Grafana. Um, it creates a brand product, because when people we talk about that observability stuff, they won't probably use that word. They will say, yeah, those dashboard stuff, or if you put a name on this, uh, you can think of funny name, you can then print stickers, you can say meetups, sweaters, uh, all the swag. Uh, it will also help people talk about what you're doing, what you're trying to achieve, and make people curious about that. Um, I have no idea about the time, by the way. Fine, okay. Um, of course, if I had to do it again, uh, because they're young, a lot of years to see, um, I probably get top management on this. You need like really, okay, that's where we're going. Uh, the CTO says we need this tooling uh, going on. The libraries are really important. Uh, you need to maintain them, be active in the development of those libraries. Uh, when there's a new release, you need to do documentation about them, the onboarding as well. When we started um, another observability project, we went straight with the tech. We just put Prometheus on us, and that's it. We just had the infrastructure metrics. So Ops was fine, SRE was fine, but we did not have any insight about the applications because the applications weren't exposing any metrics. So you guess what's the point? If I don't even see the request of the applications or the latency, I just see the load of my database. This is what I did better than what I used to have. 
So you need to spend a lot of time with humans. You have to understand what they're expecting, what they want, what you can provide them with, talk with them. That's a lot. That's uh, talking is a, a thing you see a lot in the DevOps literature as well. Uh, talking, talking again, talking again, like in that novel, The Phoenix Project, uh, where you go it's way with the business people, talk to them. It's really important. You need to rules to have rules, of course, that cardinality issues, but you also have the retention. Um, what metrics can go on? You also know have GRPD, so that's also really important, uh, especially in the logs. Um, and then, of course, uh, since it's a product you're building, it does not need to be feature complete from the start. You don't need to have everything perfectly, uh, the perfect car, you know. Uh, so start small. Uh, let's just do uh, one language, one dashboard. See what where it leads us, and see where if the company is going through the for this. Um, I have no idea at the time, so I can still keep talking <laughs> because I really love this subject. Um, what I think most is you keep back to the SRE pillars uh, when you introduce observability. For the first time, that we see what's going on in production. So that we, we get starting with that feedback loop. Once that feedback loop goes again, uh, you need to go faster. So that's where the other like user monitoring comes. And then you can make start making the right decisions about your product, about what you're building, and then you can start experimenting. That's also really interesting here. That's why you, we build, um, it's where it all ties in, where Kubernetes comes in, where you can do smart deployments, focus on your users, uh, release to 1%, do A-B testing, stuff like that. If you don't have that base of observability and no one trusts in that, you won't go far, I think. Um, if you want to keep talking about this subject, yeah, and essentially, any question, maybe, before I'm I finish? <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, if there is any question, anyone? No? Then... So I'm still young, a lot of things to learn, so take this with a grain of salt. Yeah, so I think you are here all the night, so yeah. afterwards, so yeah, thank you. Okay, now it's time for the lightning talk with some cool demo, as I had. Um, and we have a Toby who will be speaking about his bank account, hopefully. Can everyone hear me okay? Cool, so give me like one minute to get started. I need to somehow figure out how to share my screen. Yeah, I feel kind of bad like following such a well-considered presentation about human beings with my kind of frivolous talk about my bank account. <laughs> Who here uses Monzo just as a question? Who here doesn't know what Monzo is? Cool. Can people see my screen? Okay. Not the presentation. So obligatory before I start on this talk, observing your bank account using Prometheus and Grafana. Um, I work for the government digital service. We're technically part of the cabinet office and we do work on these things. So websites like gov.uk. Uh, I work on the gov.uk PAS team. 
these are the, some, some of the things that we use in production. You wouldn't expect the civil service to use things like this, but we do. Uh, and uh, we're hiring, so go to this URL if you want to work on interesting things for the public sector. I'm here to talk to you about my bank account, or rather how Prometheus and Grafana are cool tools for observability um, as part of like a learning project. Uh, so as a quick recap for people who aren't familiar with Prometheus, it scrapes things. So we've got a thing and a thing and Prometheus is looking at those things and it looks at the things and provides metrics about them. Um, and then Grafana can query Prometheus to make pretty things, right? This is fairly self-explanatory. Like you've all self-selected as coming to a Prometheus meetup. Um, this is Monzo. Monzo is a very bright orange card, a bank like, a cloud native bank account, if you will, um, like attempting to make banking nice. I'm quite a happy Monzo customer. Um, but the app, you know, it shows you what's happening, but it's not integrated into my life with my Kubernetes cluster. So uh, how, how, how do I do this? Uh, Monzo doesn't support out of the box uh, and a while ago, we were starting to use Prometheus a little bit more at work. So I decided to think about how to do this as a learning exercise. Um, so you can go on um, developers.monzo.com and you can sign in with your Monzo account, which is a surprisingly difficult process uh, if you've ever used the app. And you can then build something like this um, because it turns out that integrating a Prometheus metric server with something that requires like OAuth refresh tokens from a phone is hard. Um, but basically, a user signs in to the OAuth server, which then does the OAuth two legged journey with the Monzo API and then passes that to a collector where Prometheus can scrape some metrics. And eventually, you get all the way out here in Grafana to nice dashboards. Uh, what is that diagram? not going to make any sense. So let's dive into a demo. Um, so start looking at the other screens. You kind of all screwed up by not being close to that thing over there. But um, So this is Prometheus. I've got, I've got um, Prometheus running in a Kubernetes cluster using one of the many different distributions of Prometheus operator. Uh, but I've got this thing over here called Monzo Exporter, um, which is currently looking at my bank account. In fact, if any of you go to uh, monzo.tobies.cloud, you can sign in and get your bank account scraped as well. Um, <laughs> um, also, if you go to uh, monzo.me slash keylawnwr, you can send me money. Um, so I have a Prometheus, I have a Grafana dashboard of my bank account, um, which shows me my balance and my spending over the course of the day. So this green line is my current account balance and this orange line is my spend. Uh, they're on separate axes in case you think I'm far too profligate with my money. Um, I've got a little radar up here which shows me how much money I've got on my card and I can get Grafana to alert me if my account balance drops too low. I have a nice little gauge here which um, says how much money I've spent today. And you can kind of look at this nice little time series of what I've actually done in my day which is in hindsight, exactly what you get from the Monzo app. So I woke up this morning, I purchased some breakfast, and I purchased some lunch. And then you can see this tiny little green blip over here that I'm going to zoom in on, which is uh, my coworker reimbursing me for coffee. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you can eventually, over time, as Prometheus tries to not lose your data, um, work out what your financial history is. Uh, and so you can do things like, let's look at all of my pots that aren't my savings account that aren't orphaned pots. Or you can do stuff like, what is my Monzo current balance over time, uh, which is the same chart of um, my spending throughout the day. And you can also see that it keeps on renewing tokens, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's a thing I built as, why did I do it? Um, I'm not very good at reading documentation, especially the Prometheus documentation. There's a lot of stuff in there about vectors. Uh, yeah, it, it's easier for me to learn things by doing things. So I did a thing. It turned out to be simultaneously a lot easier and harder than it. Like the Prometheus Go client is really nice, 
um, but OAuth continues to be the bane of my existence. Uh, it's open source here at github.com slash klwr slash monza explorer. Um, that was the talk. If you have any questions other than why, uh, because there's probably no good answer to that, please ask it in the next 30 seconds. Um, other than that, go have a break. Again, if anyone has questions, we can field some now, or I think Toby will be around later. So either way, questions, anyone? I can throw the mic out. No? Well, on a related topic, the Monzo app, yes. I don't like the graph on there because mine's always going down for some reason, and I don't know why that is. I keep phoning support, and it doesn't get fixed. So Chris, Miles. Anyway, yeah, let's go for a break. Go and grab a drink. and um, be back here in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Our last talk of the evening. Um, so um, Lucas is going to talk about Unseen and Karma. Um, if you guys haven't seen this project before, it's really interesting. It's one of the things I, as soon as I saw it, desperately wanted to go and um, drop into our production environments. Um, so yeah, enjoy. Brilliant. Well, there we go. Over to Lucas. Hello. Everyone can hear me? Great. Uh, hi, my name is Lukas Mirva. I'm an SRE at Cloudflare. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Karma. It used to be called NC. Now it's a different project with different UI. The new one is written in React. Can you hear me now? Maybe when I turn my head, try not to do that then. Uh, it's a Karma is another dashboard. Uh, it just shows you all the alerts you have in Alert Manager uh, as a grid. Uh, so it's a specialized UI. It's not a replacement for Alert Manager, uh, as some people call it. You might find it on GitHub. Uh, you can remember the link or can write it down now. Just Google Karma dashboard. That should work. Uh, so how does it work? You can declare multiple Alert Manager instances and it's going to call the Alert Manager API and just grab all the alerts and silences from it and keep it in memory. It doesn't use any databases or any external services. It's just going to keep everything in memory. Uh, it's going to apply some transformation to all the data from Alert Manager. So, for example, every alert will be tagged with all the Alert Manager instances it was spotted in. So. That is also used by the, the duplication later. Uh, and that means that you can have either HA cluster or multiple HA cluster or whatever mix and match you want uh, in terms of alert manager upstreams, and it can collect from all of those. Uh, that is sometimes useful if you have a lot of alert managers. I don't think a lot of people have that because alert managers scale quite well in like single instance even. Um, but if you did, Karma can provide you with like unified view of all the others from all those different alert managers. Uh, it allows you to filter all the alerts, which I believe alert manager can do that easily these days too. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, there's the duplication, so it's not gonna tell show you multiple alerts uh, if an alert multiple times if it was found in multiple alert manager instances. Uh, so. The UI is mostly focused on presenting the alerts in the in a way that allows you to quickly realize what they are. Uh, it's a different UI than what you have in Alert Manager, where it's more focused on browsing and providing you all the information you can get uh, about alerts. Uh, there's also the duplication of the labels, as you can see, like all the common labels are moved down to the footer. So we only have all the unique labels on every alert. Uh, and the thing, it should be quite easy. All you need is an instance of alert manager and some alerts to actually see something. Uh, and then you can just use the binary from GitHub or a Docker image. Uh, and the only required piece of configuration is a URI for alert manager. Uh, if you want to specify multiple, instances of alert manager to track then it's best to use config file 
Uh, there's documentation on that on GitHub. Uh, there's also a demo site that you can use. Uh, I actually use it for testing mostly. Uh, every time I merge the master, there's a Docker image deployed there. So it typically represents the latest master. But also PRs will deploy there, so sometimes it might be actually broken if I push something that doesn't end up working well. Uh, so that brings us to why does Karma exist and why did I wrote it in the first place? Uh, and that's really just a single reason. It's a question I couldn't get from answered from our previous monitoring system. And that was quite basic question, frankly. What is alerting right now? Uh, it was really difficult to get a list of all currently firing alerts. And when there's an incident, to know what else needs fixing. Uh, and that proved to be difficult for a few reasons. And this will help you understand why. Uh, Clever is a security company. We route a lot of internet traffic through our network. Uh, that's a lot of requests. Uh, and we have a lot of data centers. And we do monitor a lot of things on our network and on our services. And that ends up being a lot of alerts that could potentially fire. Uh, we're fairly stable and our services work well, but we are heavily uh, internet uh, relying. But we rely on internet a lot. And whenever there's something happens on the internet, which is not a very reliable place, we're gonna have alerts. Uh, that we need to deal with. Uh, so back in 2014, we were using Nagios and OpenTSDB, and it was fairly common setup to have a different tool for alerting and different for metrics. Uh, and uh, we were running into a lot of scalability and scalability issues with that setup. Uh, so, uh, and Nagios really couldn't tell us that because of those problems, um, because we had already quite a lot of servers and uh, a lot of things that we monitor and alert on. Our single Nagios Insta was taking roughly 90 seconds to just give you any answer. So when you had an incident and you wanted to get a list of all the alerts that currently are firing and affecting given location, you had to wait 90 seconds after every page refresh just to get an idea of what is actually broken. Uh, and that didn't work well. Uh, we use other channels for notification as well, not just like Wave UI, um, but because there was no aggregation in Nagios, that meant that there was a lot of messages there and it was really hard to keep track of all of that. Uh, so, in, uh, so during an incident, or as I mentioned, like we're fairly stable, but we run on physical hardware. And that means that for example, when a disk fails or we have some hardware issues, we need to solve that. And until we do that, we're gonna have alerts that are gonna be silenced for days or possibly weeks. And to make things worse, when you have 180 data centers, and we have roughly right now, you're gonna have some in places where like support is going to work less reliably than some big European cities. So that slow things down. You also need to deal a, lot, deal a lot with customs and shipping things around the world. And that also prolongs uh, solving uh, hardware issues. Uh, so that means that at any given day, we might have a lot of alerts that are silenced simply because we sit on top of hardware that we just need to fix. Uh, and that's a different setup than a lot of cloud-based services going to use where they can just spin up a new EC2 instance, for example. So uh, another thing is incidents, where as I mentioned, we monitor a lot of things and we have a lot of metrics uh, that we use. Uh, and because Nagios didn't really have any inhibition, well, it does have a dependency tree, but because the number of alerts we had, it was too resource intensive to actually calculate all the dependency tree on reload. So every time we, we would reload configuration in Nagios, it would take three minutes just to do that. Uh, so it was painful. So we had to compromise on a lot of things. Uh, so because of that, we effectively didn't have an inhibition for alerts. That means that when we would have a network event, like a transit provider that we use would have some problems, we would get a flood of alerts for all the possible services that could be affected by that. Uh, and that meant that it was really hard to just get an idea of 
what is happening, what services are affected, and what should we be doing at a given moment. Because as I mentioned, like the UI was really slow for us. Uh, so in 2015, uh, we started a project called Let's Fix Monitoring. As you can see, naming is hard. Uh, and uh, we did investigate a lot of alternatives to nudges in OpenTSDB, and we finally settled down on Prometheus, uh, as it was as it seemed most uh, beneficial for us. And it gave us a lot of improvements. Uh, it wasn't an instant migration, like it took us a year, I think, to migrate most of the alerts. Uh, and we had a, one track for migrating just the metrics, because as I mentioned, we had alerts and metrics in two different systems. So we could migrate both of these independently. So we would migrate metrics first. And uh, once we had all the metrics we needed for alerts in Prometheus, then we could start migrating alerts for those metrics. Uh, so once we did that, like the thing that already migrated, uh, we had a lot of improvements. Uh, the quality of life improved drastically overnight for those things. Uh, first of all, was real observability. Uh, like in Nadja's world, you just run a script whenever you want to check whenever something works or not. So what you end up doing in a lot of cases is fork the logic of your application because the thing that checks it needs to be aware of what it's doing. Uh, so with Prometheus, the setup is different. Like the application you want to observe just outputs metrics. So the, the business logic doesn't get leaked outside of it. Uh, and that means that you, you have real observations about your services. Uh, that also means that it's easier to, for example, deploy to Canary because if your changes involve logic changes that needs to be reflected in monitoring, you just, your new application just needs to output metrics differently or cal calculate those metrics differently. It was also really easy to integrate with Prometheus. Uh, writing exporters is pretty well documented. It's pretty simple pattern. And that allows us to have better metrics for our own services, which we have quite a few. Uh, and also, this broke uh, the nudges world kind of model where you have a server and you have services attached to that server, uh, which works well, which worked well for like static deployments when you just have physical hardware and you deploy specific services to that and they just stay there until you need to deploy it on a bigger server or things like that. And it works well for like web server, but it doesn't really work well for dynamic services. For example, we run Kafka, and in Kafka world, you have topics, and those topics are split into partitions. And if you wanted to monitor each of those independently, uh, you would have to generate nudges configuration for each of those and keep updating that all the time whenever your Kafka uh, topics and partition changes, which is quite a lot of overhead. And with Prometheus, we just don't need to worry about that at all because alerts are detached from service like objects in Nagy's world. Mm. We also spent some time looking at Prometheus best practices and we tried to enforce better naming. So we tried to get rid of ambiguous names like MySQL metrics. When you get an alert that tells you MySQL, like it doesn't really explain what's happening. So we put a lot of effort into just using proper names that clearly describe what is the problem. And that was really big change. And it, it was bigger benefit than anyone expected. Uh, and we try to uh, do that all the time, as in like continue doing like and, and emphasize proper naming. Uh, it seems like a simple thing, but the problem is that people quickly get used to all the old names, like it becomes a jargon in a company. And when it's settled, it's really hard to change that. So, here we had the opportunity to fix that, and that worked quite well. Uh, so once we migrated, like answering this question finally became easier because instead of waiting 90 seconds to give to get an answer from Nagios, we would get an answer from Alert Manager in like 200 milliseconds or so. Uh, but there were caveats. One of those was that Alert Manager UI at the time was written in Angular and as I mentioned, like we have a lot of alerts. Most of them are silent because they just represent 
broken hardware or the maintenance that we're doing somewhere. Uh, sorry. Uh, but alert manager really didn't like when you try to render thousand alerts and things like that. And by default, if you just go to alert manager, you would try to output everything it had. Uh, and that just meant that your browser would melt and you wouldn't get anything. Uh, but the API would give you that quickly. It was just the UI that wasn't capable of doing that. Uh, the other issue with UI is that it, was, it wouldn't refresh itself. So it's, Alert Manager is not really something you can put on a wall monitor and just have it there to show you if there's anything you need to worry about. Uh, and there were some tickets open on GitHub that I found. One of them, one of them was a PR to add a refresh every 30 seconds, but it was declined. So with explanation that it's not really something that Alert Manager at this stage wants to do. So it looked like Alert Manager developers are not really interested in pursuing that direction yet. Uh, and that kind of put me on a path to just quickly hack something. Uh, and that, uh, let's move backwards here. Ah, sorry, yeah, and the first version was very simple. As I mentioned, during an incident, we would often get a flood alert that would just make it impossible to tell you what are currently firing alerts because there would be a flood of alerts that are firing, then some recoveries and so on. And it was hard to keep track of all of that. Uh, there was no view you could look at and say, those are the things that are still broken and need fixing. Uh, so the first thing I did was just a very simple flask app that would get everything from Alert Manager uh, API, filter that, and only display very important alerts, like above certain priority. Uh, so that was useful during incident, uh, just to see if, so to see those high level incident representing alerts. Uh, and that was very, very simple app. It was pretty much just a blank screen that sometimes on occasion would show you a few items. Uh, and I did that pretty much in a day. So that wasn't, Hardly, that was not very useful in general, just for us. Uh, but it proved useful, as in when we had incidents, uh, it did provide us with the benefit of knowing what are the alerts that we still need to solve or what are the incidents that we need to solve. Because as I mentioned, we have a lot of data centers. So there's the rare possibility that while you're dealing with one incident, there's another incident that's going to start in a different location. And if you can't tell from your uh, alert uh, channels, what's happening, then that makes it hard uh, to action. Uh, so there was a, another version that kind of get rid of the hard-coded filtering. The previous one was based on a receiver uh, that we were using for uh, incident describing alerts. Uh, and people started slowly using it. Uh, and so I added a few more features because it proved to be useful. Uh, at some point, I migrated the backend from Flask to Go, mostly because it was really hard to have um, Python application when there's one piece that fetches uh, something from multiple APIs and also have uh, something that handles front end at the same time. I would have to deal with threads, and that's never pleasant with Python. In Go, it's just writing go in front of a function and that solves it. Uh, I did rewrite the JavaScript front end a few times, mostly to try to write nice jQuery, but that proved to be difficult, mostly because I'm not web developer, so I don't really know what the proper use of jQuery is. Uh, and that eventually got an open sources on C. Uh, then later I had some time off and I was a little bored, I needed a hobby, and also wanted to learn React. So I rewrote the entire UI in React uh, and did some changes over the backend, and that became Karma. Uh, and with all of that, we finally got like a dashboard that we could use that could reliably tell us what is currently still firing uh, when you have incident. Uh, we also did some other changes to make our life easier, like we embrace inhibition in Alert Manager a lot more. Uh, 
but with that, which is the vanilla alert manager UI still is a little difficult to use, uh, mostly because as I mentioned, we do have a lot of alerts underneath and alert manager UI just makes it not that easy to just browse through uh, such a big list. Uh, oops, sorry. And that's pretty much it. Questions? Yes. Uh, thanks very well, The scale of the deployment of Karma and Prometheus, because Cloudflare is a huge company, spans around the globe. How many Prometheuses you guys have? How many of these Karmas uh, do you have? How scalable the whole setup is? And uh, you also mentioned some complexity in like when there's a ton of alerts firing all over the place. So that question kind of goes in there too. Like how does it all stick together with a huge scale when you have thousands and thousands of servers all around the globe and apps and everything? Thank you. Right. So when it comes to Prometheus deployment, I think we did like at least one talk when we covered a little bit in details how we do that. Basically, we have Prometheus in every data center we run, like at least one instance, like typically more. That all depends on the size of the data center. Uh, it's more like one Prometheus per number of servers. Uh, and each of those Prometheus is just tracks keeps track of local servers and will alert to I think we have one cluster of alert manager like alert manager starts quite well uh, it can handle quite a lot uh, so we have an HA cluster that's like two instances in two different locations so there's just a central alert manager and there's only one karma instance as well Yeah, so so uh, j just to confirm, because this sounds really cool, that uh, you have one Karma instance that you're monitoring the whole Cloudflare with and uh, that you use to understand what's actually happening. Is that correct? Ish. Uh, well, we monitor, like we get notification in different ways, depending on severity. Uh, so for example, all alerts that are firing, uh, you will find that either in Alert Manager or Karma. Then for notification wise, uh, the big alerts, the incident alerts that we need to action immediately that represent like an outage, those travel via pager duty. So someone will be paged about that. But uh, that typically when you get that, there's also a bunch of alerts that are more specific that are gonna be firing. Uh, and you won't see those in pager duty, like those you need to go to Karma to see those. Uh, there are also alerts that just gonna create Jira because those are like low impact or they represent like broken disks or something like that. Uh, and that's those, all the answers. Are, thank you. Right. So that will go to via Jira alerts to Jira. Thanks again. Yeah. More questions? We got one in the back. Why should we run over there? I'll um, I'll give one. Um, why haven't you upstreamed it back to um, the Prometheus guys? This seems as though it fit perfectly within Alert Manager. Have you talked to those guys about this before? One reason is that Alert Manager is now Elm, which I have zero experience, so it would require a rewrite. As I mentioned, I rewrote, rewrote the UI in React because I wanted to learn React and was bored. Like I just needed code to write, and that was an example I could use. Uh, I found I find benefit in not having anything in Alert Manager. Like it's quite critical piece of like business logic handling. Uh, so I feel like there's benefit in just having something a layer up. Uh, yeah, especially that we don't upgrade Alert Manager all that often. Like we just don't want to take too much risks with that. So I'm not opposed to like merging that. It just I would have to do a lot of Thank you. Good question. Uh, do you do any correlation of alarms in uh, Karma? So you, let's say you have a availability zone going down. Uh, do you correlate these alarms somehow to make it uh, more easy to comprehend? We do that mostly with inhibition rules. No, sorry, not inhibition rules. We do aggregation. Uh, and we do that, like different teams or different people will do that slightly differently, but typically like 
there will be a second alert that's going to inhibit all their alerts and the second alert will be like if the issue affects like multiple instances then instead of creating alerts per instance this will just be one alert that tells you like there's 20 servers affected by something so for example when you have running load of disk space let's say typically you rise an alert for every instance of that so you're going to have alert per server or per disk that's running low of space but you can have a rule in alert manager uh, with the same alert name which by the way i discovered at some point that you can have multiple alerts with the same alert name and that works fine uh, so when you have a second rule that's gonna do the same query you do for your per instance alert but it's gonna use like count and higher than let's say 20 and that's going to generate an alert that's going to tell you there's 20, 20 instances that are running low on disk space. That's going to create an alert, and that alert is going to inhibit all the other alerts. So in UI, you're just going to get one box with a message saying that there are multiple servers affected by this. And Karma itself doesn't do anything. We do that via alert rules. Uh, let's say you have a router going down in one availability zone and one availability zone goes completely black, you see nothing. Will you get uh, thousands of alarms or do you have uh, one alarm that says that uh, this availability zone is down and uh, don't look at the individual components themselves? Right, so Karma itself won't do anything about that. It literally just grabs everything it gets from Alert Manager API, like all the alerts and displays that. Uh, so we do some aggregation, but we do that via alert rules. So we write alerts in a way that makes them like collapsed, like merged eventually if they're above some threshold. Yeah, it's worth to know that this feature is called inhibits and they are well documented on Alert Manager and so there's no point in reproducing it in, in your project. Yep, any other questions? Maybe if not, I have a quick one. So you have Unseen and Karma, right? Like. And it makes sense to not kind of brought, uh, bring those things into Alert Manager because the project itself is well focused. Um, those maintainers don't know the front end, they don't want anything magic. It's similar to Prometheus UI and Grafana, right? But what about merging ANSI and Karma in some way? Like, because you might be confusing as a new user, we want to roll probably uh, the ANSI or Karma on production and improbable. Uh, but like, how to, what to choose? Like, well, ANSI is the old thing. Karma is the new thing. If you want to, you want support for Alert Manager 017, then you need Karma because ANSI doesn't support that API change in Alert Manager. Awesome. Yeah. That's that's a new side I wanted to hear. Cool. New question. I was wondering in the uh, UI that you showed us, how do you define those groupings of alerts? Like this is done in Alert Manager. You have the group by in Alert Manager configuration. Okay. So it just follows that. Oh, it just picks it up and just yeah. displays it natively. OK, cool. Uh, so like some people, like I didn't know that you can have that per receiver. So like initial version didn't really do that. I discovered that later because some of our teams wanted to group alerts different than other teams. So I had to add support for that. Uh, and so I learned about receivers that way. <laughs> I've got you here. Uh, now you have all these alerts in one place. Are you starting to re to realize that some of them you don't actually need, um, or like, are you finding that they're actually all necessary? I guess I'm. I, I I understand the scale that you're operating at, but I'm also wondering whether you are starting to detect noise amongst all of this, and whether that's starting a feedback loop for you. I. Uh, Yes, like the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is that we try to refine alerts all the time. Uh, we also have a lot of test alerts that won't show up anywhere unless you like try really hard. Uh, like there's a dedicated Google chat that gets all those alerts and uh, there's a dedicated receiver. So like they're hidden, but people still can figure out whenever those alerts works and fire when they should. Uh, and uh, I think like we have decent feedback loop because we have a team that's responsible for like the first line of support uh, and they can 
tweak typically those alerts or like provide feedback if those alerts are too noisy. So we try to refine that all the time and like find balance between like getting proper insight and not being flooded with too many alerts that tell you the same thing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think we'll um, leave it there. A round of applause for Lucas, please. Ah, another gauge has gone back to zero. Must mean we're out of time. Um, before we go, though, we already have our next meetup planned. Um, 20th of August, um, we'll be at Lush. Um, they have an amazing office, um, much like the Cloudflare guys. However, it smells amazing. <laughs> so good. Um, so yeah, put that in the diary. We'll be putting some um, announcements out, putting um, up on meetup.com. We'll try and not make it clash with other meetups that month. Um, yeah, that was awkward when we found out CNCF were on the same night. Great. Um, and that is it. Thank you again to Cloudflare, Grafana for the pizzas, and all of you guys for attending. Thank you very much. And see you all later. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> Stickers on the table over there. If you want Thanos or Prometheus stickers, they are on the table, so grab them on the way out. And we are looking for speakers. That's also um, so. Even for the for the next meetup, like we always looking for um, an interesting topic about Prometheus monitoring. And if you feel brave, like talk to us. We can help preparing as well, and you can talk at uh, our meetup. <laughs>